thank you so much, uh, Cry You Won. And um, just thank you for all of our conference planners, the EPIP staff that has really put together this great mix of content, but also culture from our host city. And uh, also thank you to all of our wait staff who's providing such a wonderful meal for us. So at this time, we're going to begin our lunch panel titled Progressive Philanthropy in the South, Examining Ecosystems of Social Justice. And we have some wonderful people who are going to tell their stories to us today. Uh, we'll have a moderator in Gladys Washington, Program Director of the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation in North Carolina. And she'll be joined by her co-panelists, Bill Kopsky, Executive Director of the Arkansas Public Policy Panel, Reagan Gruber Moffitt, Associate Vice President of the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation in Arkansas and EPIP board member, as well as Albert Ruesga, President and CEO of the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yeah. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> I think we can do a little better than that. Good afternoon. This is the South, a land of call and response. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, all of you for being here uh, and EPIP making, uh, bringing this meeting to the South. I'm a little mad with Michael uh, and Emily for putting us behind Cry You Won and oh, yeah. um, <laughs> Enduring Lunch, bad spot. Um, but we're gonna try and um, keep you in, engaged and we're gonna ask for your participation as a part of this panel as well. Um, we are going to present some things, but as Albert always reminds me, we are in the city of jazz and improvisation is likely up here this afternoon. <laughs> um, so again, thank you uh, for being here and listening to us. We want your participation to begin with, um, to just um, give us a sense of what you think uh, about the South. So I asked the question, just in a few words, a couple pop-up answers about what few words initially come to mind when you think about social justice in the South. Community. I'm sorry? Community. Community? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank y'all. I'm kind of old. So <laughs> y'all need to talk louder. Power. Power? Political will. Political will. Ancestral courage. Ancestral courage. Oh, I like that. Others? Rural. Rural. Right. Racism. That too. What? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a sense that the South is less progressive in social justice than the North, but not as well as if you look at a lot of the movements that are taking place, I would have to call them progressive. Good. Mm. That was more than a word, but they was, those were good words. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It is okay. Thank you. Well, the South is all of that, um, as you all know. Uh, one other piece of participation and question for you. If you would, raise your hands if your foundations have a Southern strategy. Hmm. Uh -huh. That's it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I apologize. Um, again, uh, <laughs> I told you there, was, there would be lots of improvisation up here this afternoon. Um, but I would ask my, uh, the panelists here to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their work and how place plays a role in what they do and why the South matters. And um, we'll begin with sort of a, a local perspective. We heard a lot about what the Greater New Orleans Foundation was doing um, in the er areas of justice, equity, um, workforce development, uh, all kinds of things. Um, and so we want to hear directly from Albert Reska about 
um, all of that, followed by uh, Reagan Moffitt, who will talk about the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation and the work that they do with their partners, uh, the Arkansas Public Policy Panels, with um, Bill Kopsky. So, Albert, if you would, please lead us off. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Gladys. Um, I would say, if you look at uh, how the South is standing up in terms of, let's say, racial disparities, our racial disparities are, there's no other word for it, it they're a disgrace. Uh, our incarceration rate is stratospheric. Um, it's, it's a place that is very, very tough for uh, a number of communities. Uh, I, was, I, I was looking at uh, a law that was uh, ruled unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, uh, the uh, anti-sodomy law in Texas. I think it was ruled unconstitutional in 19, it was about 20 or 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a law that's still being enforced in Louisiana. Not only is it on the books in Louisiana, it's still being enforced in Louisiana. Um, and this is a, a, a kind of situation or a kind of context in which community foundation work as usual is not going to work. Uh, it can't be the usual model of community foundation work. And the usual model is that uh, community foundations attend to uh, the needs of the donor community uh, by providing uh, ways for individuals and families and corporations to give. And, uh, and there might be some programmatic work that happens as well if there's uh, additional or discretionary funding. And we quickly realized that, uh, first of all, we needed to find a way to connect the two pieces of that work. And we connect uh, the two pieces of that work by trying to introduce as many of our donors as we can over time to amazing uh, community-based work. And we do that by literally busing wealthy individuals to nonprofit organizations to um, do things like speed dating with executive directors of community-based organizations, having them sit at tables with wealthy donors and describing uh, the work that they do in community. And uh, just like going to church or just like going to the university, it's a transformative experience for many of these donors who for the first time have ventured, in many cases, outside of their neighborhoods, for the first time have ventured into neighborhoods where this incredible transformative work is happening in our city. And they're moved and they are, um, not only moved, but they go back to their homes and they write $10,000 checks and $25,000 checks uh, to support some of the most important uh, frontline work uh, that happens in our city. And I look at the lists of grants made by donor advisors uh, every week, and certainly at the beginning you see a lot of the usual uh, kinds of grants. Uh, you see grants to the New Orleans Museum of Art, the Louisiana Philhar Philharmonic Orchestra, and these are very important organizations that we need to support. They really help uh, bring up the quality of life for all of us. My sense is that over time, I've seen many more of these grants going to community-based organizations. And so promoting philanthropy, promoting the work of community-based organizations is very much part of our mission. We also do that, for example, uh, with our Giving Day. We had a Giving Day last week called the Give NOLA Day uh, that raised some uh, $4 million for local nonprofit organizations. And again, uh, oh, <laughs> very cool. <laughs> and uh, we're very proud of that. Again, uh, there was money that went to the usual suspects, some of the very large organizations. They did very well on that day. But also, we heard from a lot of community-based organizations that was, this was the first time that they had ever had uh, an individual donor give them any money. Uh, many of the organizations had uh, their brush with the new donors uh, that they are now beginning to cultivate. So that's part of the work. And the fees, obviously, from a lot of these funds pay for the programmatic work, which is so much uh, at the heart of what we do. And we do our programmatic work in what we call a social justice lens uh, but for us, it's a, it's a no-brainer uh, kind of lens. We have uh, incredible uh, racial disparities. Uh, we have income disparities. 
uh, we have uh, so many issues that we need to address, and we see a lot of the services that we provide to the donor community is helping to fund that work. And we also look to uh, many of you in, in this room for creative partnerships that uh, we can form and work together in whatever area that might be of interest to you, because we do work in economic justice, we do work in the environment, uh, we do capacity building work, uh, because without that capacity building work, really a lot of our organizations are the, the Davids trying to, to slay the Goliaths. And I think that this is, um, there are other community foundations that are trying this model. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's an important model for us to get away from, I think community foundations uh, will go the way of the dodo uh, unless they begin to think of how to reinvent themselves and really, not for the sake of reinventing themselves, but for the sake of justice and taking the lessons uh, not only that we learned uh, 10 years ago, or should have learned 10 years ago, coming up on 10 years uh, for the uh, 10th uh, anniversary of Katrina, uh, but that we've learned from Ferguson, the lessons that we've learned from Baltimore as well. That's just a, a snapshot of, of what we do. Thank you, Elle. That was great. Megan? I'm Reagan. I'm with the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation in Arkansas. Um, and we've got big goals for the state around increasing educational attainment, having less poverty in the state. Um, but we also have a mission that specifically lays out um, doing that by approaching uh, disparities, by, um, by looking at uh, racial uh, justice as, as a piece of it. And I think that as we look at our work, that, that can be awfully lonely in the South. Um, there was a study done recently by Grant Makers for Southern Progress that talks about the different ways that funders talk in the South and funders talk outside of the South. And it wasn't a big surprise, but it, it was stark to see it on paper that often funders in the South aren't quite comfortable with that word justice, that it makes them a little squeamish in their seats. Um, and that actually a lot of times funders outside of the South want to talk about justice and it, it creates this, this, uh, this dis divide between uh, folks being able to talk together. So I think being at a foundation in the South that has justice as a part of our mission can be awfully lonely because there's not a lot of other funders around us that are talking about it or investing in it. Uh, and so I think what we have seen is if we're going to get these goals done and if we're going to do it with a justice lens, that we have to do that in some non-traditional ways, which is looking to our nonprofit partners and blurring the lines and not having funder conversations where we then go talk to the nonprofit sector, but having conversations about what it means to have justice in the state. Also, I think the, the same is true as we talk to funders of we realize that it may be a slow road to get funders in Arkansas comfortable with the idea of justice. So looking beyond our walls and really um, trying to bridge the divide a bit to help national funders and funders outside of Arkansas understand how our work is justice, that it, it may look very different because of the context we're working in, uh, but it means the same and we have the same goals. Uh, so I'll say that much, but then have my colleague uh, and partner in crime, Bill Kopsky, and let him add on a, a bit about our work in Arkansas. The, um, so I think I'll start with, uh, uh, try to do a quick history. My organization is 53 years old. We were founded in 1963 by moms working on desegregation and uh, cultural understanding in the state. And the, the women, uh, we were originally called the Panel of American Women before we, mm -hmm. enough of us guys got insecure and we changed our name in the 70s <laughs> to the public policy panel. <laughs> and uh, the, um, but they started by having conversations with communities about what um, diversity meant and what it was like to grow up from their backgrounds. They'd always put together a panel, an African American, a white, a Protestant, Catholic, a Jew, and sometimes an Asian American when she was available. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and they would have open dialogue with communities. Uh, and they, they developed that model and, 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 uh, of really listening to communities and not talking about the politics or preaching to folks, but really engaging folks from their own experience and their own story. And respectfully, even when people were coming from in the 60s, it was socially acceptable to come from t terrible places on these issues. And so they would deal with that. 
Um, and that led them to create the state's multi first multicultural curriculum for the public schools and, and do all that sort of stuff. Eventually, it became clear that that, wasn't, that that was great and important work, but insufficient. And so they started working on policy. And they started working on policy change and had a, a young governor, uh, Clinton, um, agree to, to help do some, some change. We have one of the worst tax systems in the country. We tax poor people in Arkansas over twice the, the rate that we tax uh, the wealthy. And, uh, and Governor Clinton agreed that was a problem, agreed to create a Blue Ribbon Commission. We staffed it and did a bunch of reports for it. And then in 1987, five years into it, uh, Clinton was thinking about maybe doing something else and uh, <laughs> realized that we weren't making much progress. And he called one day and said, yeah, about that tax commission. I'm, I'm withdrawing my support for that tomorrow morning. I'd like you there to, for the press conference. Awesome. Uh, and we saw, you know, we saw years of work evaporate. So our, our leadership then really reassessed the, 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 what we were doing and really came, became focused on a couple of things. It became focused on the, the people who are impacted by the issues that we work on have the right, uh, have the ability and have the responsibility to be involved in creating the solutions. Uh, but that there's not enough of them involved and they need support to do that. So we began community organizing. We also realized that they were too isolated to make a difference uh, at the state level. So we began a coalition called the Citizens First Congress that elects an agenda that we then uh, collectively advocate for uh, before each legislative session. Uh, and then uh, uh, we do training on the political process and how people can be involved, because there's just simply not enough people. So we think, don't think the fundamental problem is water quality or education or civil rights or inequity. We think the fundamental problem is that people are disengaged from the process, excluded from the process, and that's sort of how we approach it. Um, the thing that is important from our perspective about understanding the South and organizing the South and making change in the South is that it looks a little bit different. I mean, we built a model founded by women based on dialogue with community and have grown an, or an organizing and advocacy model that works in Arkansas. It's not the same thing as what you find in New York City or Philadelphia or Chicago or wherever you want to go. And it looks a little different, and that's been challenging for some folks. But the Fundamentals are there, the principles are there, and the impact is there. The other thing is our folks are not in it for the righteous fight of, of uh, 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 the opposition. We're, mm -hmm. We'd have no interest in being the loyal opposition. Mm -hmm. um, our membership is interested in making changes in the community that matter and winning those changes. And there's a lot of opportunities in the South to make differences. Just mm -hmm. last night in Eureka Springs, uh, there was a vote to, uh, to reaffirm uh, civil rights ordinance protecting gay and lesbian people, the only uh, mm -hmm. ordinance in the uh, state, or the first ordinance in the state to be upheld to do that, mm -hmm. uh, and also offering protections to a wide variety of other uh, citizens. Mm -hmm. um, and it passed by three to one margin uh, in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Who would have thought it? And so there are opportunities to make progress. You have to find them, and you have to work with the local folks who know how to do them. But mm -hmm. that's, that's probably a good start. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, again, I'm Gladys Washington, and I promise this will be my only interjection in this panel process. She lies. She's a liar. <laughs> <laughs> but I am with the Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation, and we are a regional foundation that works in the South, all across the South, a tiny family foundation. Um, and our mission is to uh, support organizations and networks helping to move people and places out of poverty and achieve greater social and economic justice in the South. <laughs> it's a big mission. Um, but how we operationalize that is that, first of all, we recognize that there are many Souths. As Bill said, the organizing that they do, it looks different in New York. It looks different in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. All right? I mean, it's just the infrastructure looks different. But there are opportunities to find those differences and work with the organizations that, that um, we do that help support justice work. And we do it strategically with other foundations, like uh, the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation. We, um, we strategically um, focus on how we're going to support that work that goes on in Arkansas. So uh, again, I, I, I hope that part of the, 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 uh, the piece that you get out of this, um, this plenary is that there is opportunity here and there is opportunity to partner with folks who already know how to partner. Because um, sometimes you don't, folk don't know how to partner. Tell the truth and shame the devil, amen? <laughs> okay, 
Um, and so um, as we, we continue. That's um, a southern phrase, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I use those often. Uh, it's a southern idiom. You're exactly right. Um, so let me go back to Albert for just a second. Um, can you talk a little bit about what tools, what techniques, what programs um, have uh, most impacted your communities um, through the Community Foundation? Sure. Um, well, you know, one of the, we have a very, uh, a problem with poverty uh, in New Orleans and, you know, the most proximate cause of poverty is not having any money, so we uh, <laughs> obviously focus on economic opportunity and for us that means uh, getting people who are looking for jobs into jobs. Uh, using models that really have been tested uh, across the country uh, by an organization called the National Fund for Workforce Solutions. So we're a National Fund for Workforce Solutions site. And, uh, and that means uh, doing this funny thing of having the uh, employers uh, talk about uh, and actually dictate the content of the training, working with a training provider like our local community fund, uh, sorry, local uh, community college, and then guaranteeing jobs for those who finish the training, right? And our first uh, cohort of 48 trainees, uh, they all got jobs at Ochsner Health Care. Uh, a year and a half later, they're all still in their jobs. And these are not just jobs. Uh, these are uh, career tracks so that they're able to move uh, into uh, family sustaining wages and the director, our site director, Benita uh, Robertson, is there in, our, in, uh, in the back. <laughs> uh, very proud of that work. But it also means uh, not only paying attention to uh, money, but also paying attention to the ability of families to uh, create and retain assets, right? Because asset poverty is a huge uh, problem in uh, New Orleans. And asset poverty, you're in asset poverty, the usual definition is that if, um, if you had to survive uh, you, you can only survive for three months on the assets you have, right? Pretty much at the, at the federal poverty level, you can survive only at, uh, for three months. That's including all your savings, that's including possibly having to sell your car, right? If your car is the only way for you to get to work, you might have to sell your car in order to have enough assets. And I think it's 37% of New Orleans families, 37%, and that includes many in uh, middle income and higher income brackets, uh, includes all income brackets, are in asset poverty. So how do you help families save? Uh, and that's the missing picture, I think, often. It's not just income, but how do you help families save? How do you help them uh, secure a future for their children? How do you help them save enough so that if there's another emergency, an evacuation, they actually have money to get out of town and uh, do so safely? Uh, so those are two parts of our work. Another big piece of our work has to do with capacity, and two aspects of that is money. And capacity, money, being able, uh, uh, organizations being able to do the work that they need to do, they just need funds. And this is what I would call a PUA, a philanthropically underserved area. <laughs> uh, we don't have uh, the big guns, we don't have uh, the Kresge's and the, you know, the, the big uh, New York foundations. We have them here as partners, but they're not based here. Uh, we have a lot of national foundations that left uh, after Hurricane Katrina. And so money is a big issue, and uh, having things like Gibnola Day and other efforts to help organizations get a hold of cash is important. But then there's the other, other side of capacity, and that's just being able to do your work effectively. And uh, we do that work with all the nonprofits uh, in the region, not just the ones that we uh, make grants to, but we especially focus on our advocacy and community organizing organizations. Uh, they are uh, really, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, environment. We have the typical, uh, it's in other places it's called a downstate upstate problem or a east state, west, western mm -hmm. part of the state mm -hmm. problem mm -hmm. where you have your major city that tends to be a little blue, tends to be a little purple maybe, uh, and you have your state capital, which tends to be pretty red, uh, and certainly that way here in Louisiana. And so how do you help organizations uh, that are really trying to fight the good fight be as effective as possible when they go to Baton Rouge? Mm -hmm. So we pay a lot of attention to organizational capacity and to the usual things like financial management and fundraising and um, board development, all the usual things. 
And uh, then, of course, we pay also a lot of attention just to the environment. We had um, uh, the, our uh, performers, the, the, the group that came up talking about losing a football field every uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, that's a real concern. Uh, the real concern is that the Gulf of Mexico, we are, we're a coastal city here in New Orleans, whether we like to admit it or not, and uh, the Gulf of Mexico is creeping ever closer to us. And after a while, uh, New Orleans is really going to be affordable only to the, the mega wealthy who uh, use New Orleans as fishing camps, essentially, uh, because we'll be so far out in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So for us not to pay attention to the environmental uh, issues that we face is, is absolute insanity. And that's how we do our work. And uh, there's really no substitute uh, working with one organization at a time, several organizations at a time, helping them do the work that they need to do, which is really knocking on one door at a time, uh, changing one heart uh, and one mind at a time. That's, that's, there's, no, uh, there's no secret uh, formula. That's, that's mm -hmm. what the work is. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Albert. Um, Reagan and Bill, can you two just talk a little bit? You led me into this, Albert, because you started talking about community organizing um, and advocacy. Can y'all talk about specifically about some of the work that you all have done together? And if y'all miss anything, I'll add it for you. Because <laughs> it's a good story. <laughs> for one minor intrusion at the beginning. You start. You know, the, um, well, I'll tell you a, a, a story. Um, so part of the challenge is, well, I told you, we, we, we worked on tax reform. We had the support of the governor. We felt great about that, and we lost uh, despite massive investments uh, from the Ford Foundation and lots of work. Um, the, so the analysis became, well, we need to start organizing. And then there was the, our, the groups that we started organizing were winning things locally, uh, getting super funds cleaned up, getting police practices changed, improvements at the school, um, we've always been very multi-issue because our members define the issues for us, so we're sort of policy-wise have our fingers in a thousand camps. Um, but the, uh, we were still losing uh, everything at the state level. Um, and so our, our groups, actually, they're the ones that asked us, can, you know, they saw the business community, which we fondly call the corporate flying wedge in, in, in Little Rock, uh, <laughs> stuck together in a coalition. And it was actually our leaders who said, gee, could you help us form a coalition like that? Uh, multi-issue, statewide, uh, and so that's how the Citizens First Congress, which we called the Big Hooby Doo for the first two years of its life, uh, came to be. Uh, but there was, a, there was a question about whether it could be successful. Um, you know, would it work? And the upshot is um, it's worked spectacularly. I mean, we've passed amazing things in the state uh, because of the coalitional work, uh, both of the Citizens First Congress and then the collaborative relationships we have with all the other advocacy and organizing groups in the state. Um, and so we've really pushed, uh, you know, Arkansas now spends a billion dollars more on education per year than they did in 2003, and as a result, we have the fastest improving education system in the country. Uh, we're the, one of the only southern states besides. Excellent. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, we're uh, the only southern state besides Kentucky that's expanded Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and uh, wow. 250,000 families in Arkansas have access to health care because of it, 10% of our state population. And uh, uh, an often forgotten fact of that is it also shores up a $100 million hole in the budget um, that enables the state to continue spending money on other social service and health issues that they wouldn't be able to spend if they had to, to pull that out. The rest of the southern states need to figure that one out. Um, the, um, <laughs> Uh, but, but at any rate, we've been really successful. We've moved environmental policy. Uh, we've moved even agriculture policy. Arkansas is one of the only states in the country without a Department of Agriculture. There were only two, uh, Delaware and Arkansas. We have the 10th largest ag economy, but we didn't have a Department of Agriculture because the Farm Bureau thought they were the Department of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, and they fought it tooth and nail, and after a seven-year campaign, truly led by farmers, uh, we, we won the State Department of Agriculture that's made important improvements in the state. Um, so we, we can, um, you know, we can win. Uh, but the winning uh, really takes strong organizing. And so the other part of the story, though, is that when we first formed the Citizens First Congress, we looked around, and our membership was largely white. Uh, we had, because of our civil rights history, we had uh, maybe 30% of our members were uh, from communities of color and 70% were white, largely concentrated in the liberal blue pockets of the state, of Fayetteville and Little Rock, with some smatterings around the rest of the area. And our leadership looked at that, and we saw a problem. 
Um, we saw one that without the geographic representation across the state, we didn't have the political power mm -hmm. needed to move policy. Mm -hmm. um, so from a purely tactical standpoint. But then we also saw that the issues that we were concerned about and the communities that we were concerned about um, weren't where we were. Uh, you know, we weren't in rural, low-income, mm -hmm. African-American, Latino communities. Mm -hmm. And so we actually shifted 80% of our organizational resources into organizing in those places mm -hmm. uh, and trying to broaden out the base. Mm -hmm. And so today our membership is over 50% people of color. Uh, it's over 50% rural. Uh, Little Rock and Fayetteville are still important cornerstones, mm -hmm. uh, but we have uh, other cornerstones now across the rest of the state. And that strategy is, has, again, it's worked really well for us. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say about the, the tactics of all of this is that the, the offense that we're able to play has really made our defense easier. And uh, there's a, a great example of, um, there's been a couple of efforts, this will resonate to those of y'all in New Orleans, uh, to privatize our school system. And uh, the other side um, uh, sends out mass mailings and big media campaigns, they have a ton of money, and uh, about public schools are failing and uh, give up on the public schools and uh, uh, charters equal school reform. And that has been successful in some parts of the country. Uh, it hasn't been successful in Arkansas. We've been able to beat it two sessions in a row uh, for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons is that we have our own proactive agenda on education reform that shockingly is based in data and proven strategies. Uh, <laughs> and so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So I know I might be stepping on a couple of toes and I'm prone to do that, oh, so forgive right. me. But, <laughs> but we believe strongly that, that the communities, again, should be involved in discussions about education reform and that those discussions should be led by data and evidence and mm -hmm. not by uh, rhetoric and ideology. And in Arkansas, we have a track record. We've been investing for over 10 years in research proven strategies and they've been improving our test scores. You can't say blanketly that public education in Arkansas is failing. You can say it's not where it should be and then we can have a conversation, okay, well whose idea is the better idea to get us from where we are to where we should be, but you can't say that we can't make improvements because we can prove that we are. And so uh, anyway, so those things have all created opportunities of where the organizing really matches with the policy change mm -hmm. and, uh, and our partners in philanthropy have been really critical at helping us build the resources to do this. This is a big, expensive, and sometimes slow, grindingly slow process. Uh, and, um, and so we've been really fortunate to have the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation, the Babcock Foundation, and, and many others sort of understand that building a sustainable movement for social change in the South is, is doable and critical. Well, and I think I'll add on a, just a few things to that, one of which is that understanding the context of a state like Arkansas, which is like a lot of other states, it's small. There are only three million people in the whole state of Arkansas. So some of these wins are huge. So uh, something like Medicaid expansion, you're really looking at number of people is huge, but scale really, you can reach things. And as you think about reforming systems, Arkansas and other states like it are places that you can actually take it to scale. And I think it's really powerful um, but it's also why we know each other as well as we do. You know, both our kids got dropped off at the same daycare this morning. And, and you know, the, there are these relationships that are deep um, and there aren't a lot of groups competing for resources. A lot of groups are trying to figure out how to get the job done. And I think um, in Arkansas, at uh, Bill's idea and, and with our support, we created something we call Why Arkansas that was, was started with a report um, that, that Bill said, gosh, there really are reasons why this stuff is getting done. Um, and some of it's that we've got good relationships, but there are other things that other states can learn from what we're doing. And so it's, it's a story to get more resources to Arkansas, but quite honestly, it's a story for ourselves as well, because I think that in the South, you can often feel really alone in this work and like there's not really the ability to get it done mm -hmm. and that we need to tell the story to ourselves as advocates within Arkansas mm -hmm. that it has been done and it can be done and it will be done again. Um, and so I think, you know, again, I really appreciated the, the comment about the South really is, is not seen as progressive, but there are progressive things going on. Mm -hmm. I think we always have to remember that about the South is that it can happen, and because of the small numbers, 
you can bring things to scale with a much smaller effort. So it's, it's not to make it sound easy, but I think oh, the it's easy. scale. <laughs> yeah, it's really easy. <laughs> but the scale is really different and mm -hmm. allows things to be done that just really can't be done in a much bigger place. Mm -hmm. And two points of, of, I need you to add just one thing mm -hmm. for me, Reagan, to talk about how um, the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation has used all of its capital in the social justice and equity fights in, in Arkansas. Sure, so, you know, I think we, to be focused on the goal, we have to use all of the resources we have. So obviously through our grant making, and that's in part in how we do our grant making. Uh, we have something we call mission critical grants, of which Arkansas Public Policy Panel is one, and it says, these organizations need to be strong. We don't need to be funding a project here, a project here, mm -hmm. that we didn't know Medicaid expansion was gonna be the huge issue or the civil rights um, legislation that came up in the last session, but we need our advocacy groups to be strong. Um, and then the issues that come up will be the issues that come up and inevitably will cross uh, what we do. So that's through our grant making. We also, we're a private foundation, and so through PRIs and MRIs, so mission-related investing, program-related investments, uh, we use our capital to, um, to give uh, low-interest loans, and then also in how we do our investments, making sure that we are continuing to push forward the goals of the organization. So those are all money, but I think we also realize we have capital as an institution in Arkansas. Right. And the history of the Winthrop Rockefeller Foundation is very interesting when you, when you look at politics because Winthrop Rockefeller, you may or may not know this story, um, is kin to the National Rockefellers, um, joined the military, made a buddy, came, moved to Arkansas, bought a mountain, because that's what you do. You have money and you move to Arkansas. Um, you too could buy a mountain in Arkansas. <laughs> Quite beautiful, come visit us anytime. Um, but he also was our first Republican governor post Reconstruction and our last Republican governor post Reconstruction until Mike Huckabee, who you also know, lots of Arkansas politicians. Um, but I think because of that, um, the fact that he carried an R after his name makes people have one perception of who the governor was. But if you look at his actions, you also see uh, that he was the first to integrate state government, that he reformed our prison system, he reformed our education system, he was the only Southern governor to hold a vigil on the state capitol grounds when Martin Luther King was assassinated. So I think we're able to use that capital. Well, Democrats are the only ones that are progressives. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> you must be confused. <laughs> <laughs> So our capital is as an institution and based on our founder allows us to have a voice in, in certain situations that, that other folks may not have a voice. So I think we're very conscious of uh, what Gladys and I were talking about earlier today, the idea of a North Star, that this North Star of a better Arkansas that has justice for all and using every tool in our toolbox to get there. Mm -hmm. One of the tools they used that, that uh, Reagan did not mention, I think um, people tend to forget the things they do because they do it so fluidly, is that um, in cooperation with their nonprofit partners, they were managed to get a legislative committee to reduce poverty, and they were a part of that. Hmm. That's how philanthropic capital can be used, They're and that's how we're using it in the South. And what happened as a part of that uh, committee was that um, multiple pol policy recommendations were, were made and were enacted mm -hmm. and adopted as systems change and uh, institutional change in, in the state of Arkansas. That's what a f uh, foundation here does. Mm -hmm. So, and they're doing that on education now. Right, right they're now. doing a strategic That's plan right. for the Department of Education, which is, which is key. One of the, the things, if I can just piggyback a little bit, sure. is, uh, I mean, the unusual sort of alliances that we're able to make on issues. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I mean, the, uh, the partnership you all have on developing the strategic plan for the State Department of Ed is, is a good example of that, where there's a lot of uh, non-ideologically aligned people, would be a polite way of saying that, uh, <laughs> working together on, on a process. Um, the, uh, the importance of understand of, of really having a nuanced understanding of how to create social change, and, and the thing, the story I want to tell is on the on the uh, religious discrimination bill. 
um, that Arkansas just defeated. So you all probably heard of Indiana. Well, we had identical legislation in Arkansas. And it passed the Senate and the House. Um, and the governor was on the verge of signing it and promised everybody he'd sign it, actually pushed it through the Senate. Um, and then suddenly he, he, he decided at the last hour that, oh, well, I read the bill now. And um, <laughs> it's got some problems. And uh, there was a huge campaign uh, behind it that illustrates a couple of points. One is there was a big national organization that shall remain unnamed if I am very disciplined about this. Um, the, uh, that was hugely important in the effort, but also hugely problematic in the way they were operating. Uh, national groups working within a state, whether it's a southern state or any other state, I think tend to have challenges, uh, whether national philanthropy or national advocacy groups. One is they just have different self-interests. Mm -hmm. um, they have different goals they need to fuel the folks in the state. Our relationships with each other are paramount to anything because uh, it's how we get things done. And then we care most about winning uh, whereas sometimes national groups have other priorities of feeding their fundraising machines or fighting this broader war at the national level and whether they win the particular battle, sometimes they're willing to be more polarizing or do tactics that don't make mm -hmm. much sense mm -hmm. in the local context and they usually don't have very much local accountability for what they do, so they just sort of do it. Uh, so that was a huge mm -hmm. issue uh, on, on, on that one and, and then the national group after the campaign was won uh, sent out uh, an email fundraising appeal with their picture in front of the Capitol with giant flags of their organization in front of the Arkansas flag. It's like, oh my God, please don't do that. Uh, <laughs> Arkansans and most Southerners are pretty prickly about outsiders coming and telling us what to do. And Amen. here's this big national organization standing mm. on the steps of the Capitol yeah. with their flag bigger than our flag saying, here's what <laughs> you should do. And it's like, we were doing everything we could do to mitigate the damage from, from that. Um, and, but again, like they were bringing important capacity to the table. So it's not like they, were, they weren't bad. It's just it was challenging to, to do the work. But then they sent out an, an email uh, saying that they not only supported the campaign in Arkansas, they were the campaign in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. well, holy okay. shit, really? <laughs> 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 uh, and sorry. <laughs> you were fine. You were <laughs> but, you know, we had worked really hard um, to mobilize people of color on that issue. Uh, we had worked really hard to mobilize straight white people on that issue. Uh, the national media and this national organization wanted to frame it as a GLBT issue, which it is. Uh, but it went far beyond that, and just politically speaking, the broader we could make the base of people who felt threatened by it, the more power we had. It's mm -hmm. pretty simple math. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we had a press conference where we had people of color, we had a white Methodist minister saying this is going to legalize discrimination against white Christians like me and ergo 80% of the state. Uh, and uh, five minutes later, the National Gay and Lesbian Organization had promised not to do anything that day, holds their own press conference <laughs> to remind everybody, no, really, this is a gay and lesbian issue. Uh, and, and, and at any rate, it just became uh. really challenging. One of the pivot points in the campaign uh, came from a um, direct service organization that no one sees as a social change group in the state because they're really smart and subversive about how they do their work. And they have created the nicest, most safe organization you could ever want to have focused on citizenship and leadership training. It is awesome. It's like mom and apple pie. It is awesome. <laughs> They have developed more leaders uh, in the Latino community than any other organization in the state, bar none, by a mile, mm -hmm. uh, doing this strategy that on the surface of it looks like this safe little citizenship program. And they've developed grass tops relationships with the powers that be in Northwest Arkansas, home of Walmart and Tyson and J.B. Hunt Trucking, mm -hmm. and you all heard of them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it turns out, that the uh, Walmart came out with a letter opposed to this uh, religious discrimination bill. And the national organization took lots of credit for that. But the reality is this service organization had relationships to people on the Walmart board. And, and they said, this is a Latino issue. This is going to discriminate against people of color. You need to be opposed to this. And the Walmart's leadership said, no, this is just a gay issue. And they said, no, it's not. And they pushed them. And Walmart wrote the letter. And it was part of what turned the tide. But so sometimes social change 
is direct service. I mean, sometimes the strategies just get convoluted. So I'm sorry for the long story, but no, it, it's okay. it sort of illustrated, I think, a couple of points. So I don't know if there's more. Well, yeah. I, and I that, sort of petered out there. That's all right. We, we got you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pick you up, Peter. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I, I think that that was a, a clear illustration that there is capacity here for the inside-outside game. Um, and, and inside outside games simply means strategy, strategic foci mm -hmm. with organizations, foundations, and people that are connected in very deep ways so that that inside outside game can work. Um, so that's, that's, does that cool. sum that up pretty good? Yeah, for yeah you? No, you're All good, right. thanks. Um, Much more succinctly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we just have a few minutes left. Can each of you give me like one minute? Um, then we'll open it up to some questions about why the South is important and um, how it, how it's, what is its importance in the national context. Holy cow, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking uh, of the- uh, You can do it in 15 seconds, yeah. it'd be better. <laughs> we, have this, uh, we have this wonderful report, uh, As the South Goes, that uh, was produced by Grantmakers for Southern Progress, which is uh, at, um, the Neighborhood Funders Group uh, now. And uh, I don't know how many of you know, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, as the South goes, you know what the, how the rest of it goes, right? So goes Building the nation. The nation. Mm -hmm. And that was taken from a book uh, written by W.E. Du Bois and mm -hmm. a co-author, and I forget the name of his co-author, some of you might know it. But it's interesting because a lot of people take that as uh, a kind of uh, saying that the South is going to be this uh, great leader and will be a, a great example, but actually it was a kind of warning, and uh, this, is, uh, I'll just, this is very brief. He said, a clear vision, this is what W. E. Du Bois wrote, a clear vision of a world without inordinate individual wealth, of capital without profit, and of income based on work alone is the path out, not only for America, but for all men. Across this path, stands the South with flaming sword, uh, uh, indicating that the South could be uh, a block rather than a leader. And I think it's, I think W. E. Du Bois may change his mind or would uh, be very, very proud of the kind of work that's been done in the South, the kind of opportunities that have opened up for all kinds of uh, funders, investors, um, allies, work in every single area that you can imagine in the environment, on LGBT issues, uh, on how affordable housing, uh, on criminal justice reform. Uh, there is so much opportunity for change and so much opportunity for investment and really uh, for, uh, in a sense, uh, t heeding the warning of W.E. Du Bois, uh, but really showing that if we, can, uh, if we can do it in the South, we can do it uh, anywhere. And so that's, that's a message I would leave people with. Please uh, think of us as partners, uh, thought partners, and as partners for the work that you most want to do. Mm -hmm. And we'd love to partner with you. Mm -hmm. Some of y'all may have seen, there's been several articles recently in, in New York Times and otherwise that show major social issues like poverty and uh, lack of education, so on and so forth. And you can guess, like the map shows the same set of southern states that are projected on the screen right now. And, and we chose not to show those maps because of what Albert's talking about is there's this great opportunity. And I think, as I think about, I'm from Arkansas originally, moved away, you know, thought I would never go back to the South. Um, and came back mostly because I honestly think that we will see change in my lifetime. And in many bigger places, I knew that I could toil and toil and toil and toil, and things might change, but I might never see it, that it might never be visible. And I think in the South, there are big challenges, but people are doing great things, and there really is this chance to actually see change happen. This um, week. This week, <laughs> that's, that's powerful for the places, but it's powerful for the country as a whole because if you're only seeing small incremental change in places, how do you know that you've really made change? And if we can show change in the South, then it has implications for there, but for lots of other places that can learn with us and beside us. Um, I have a couple, couple thoughts about it. Um, 30 of the last 45 years of the United States has been governed by a Southern president. Interesting thought. 
Um, we and can leave now, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and they've represented us so well. Um, the, uh, uh, but and, you know, if you look at who's defining the upcoming presidential election, uh, deep Southern ties on, on both sides. Uh, and so the South is going to continue to play a major role. Um, if you look at the Southern, you've all have heard of the Southern strategy. Google it uh, <laughs> if you haven't. But uh, the, the Southern strategy is alive and well. And, and, and you know, there are those who've argued with the demographic shifts in the country that the angry white men in the South don't really matter anymore and we can just go around them. And I think you can look at the Congress and, uh, right now and realize that uh, they might not be strong enough to win much, but they are certainly strong enough to defeat an awful lot. And we've got to deal with that mm -hmm. to be tactically relevant. Mm -hmm. um, the other, the final thought is that if you, it's sort of like the same analysis that my organization had when we thought about, okay, we've built this coalition, we're ready to do some things, where do we go next? And realizing we needed to d diversify so we had to be politically strong enough to win and we needed to go where the issues and the folks most impacted are. If you look at where people of color are concentrated in the country, the South. Yes, yes. If you look where poverty is concentrated in the country, the South. If you look at the geographic strategy of what you need to move in terms of national policy, you cannot move, I don't believe, a national policy campaign uh, without the South. And so I not only think we can win, we can make progress in the access. You could be on a first name basis with our governor within the week if you wanted to, um, but, but also the tactical relevance of it. And, but it has to be done right, it has to be done with the right partners, and it has to be informed by the quality work happening. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was perfect, um, actually. So I hope from this plenary that what you have gotten is that there are opportunities in the South. And part of that opportunity is that there is capacity building and being strengthened all over this region around social and economic justice and structural change. Um, that we are beginning um, as a part of the problem, we've always done this, but as a part of our, our um, evolution, we are beginning to pay for our own liberation. So we ask you to join us, to put your money with our money, okay? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and what we, we are also saying is please read the As, as the South Goes um, paper. Um, we are, um, we are open, um, we are asking you to partner with us, but we ask you to come in and partner with us um, in a way that, um, that lifts up our um, expertise about place um, and that um, what could then help you to um, save a few steps and don't waste a whole lot of money. <laughs> so. Um, that's the end. If we can, we can have a few questions, right? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to do another round of Q&A like we did this morning. And um, we've, got, we've got a hand up already over there. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm Carolyn Cavicchio from the Ms. Foundation for Women. Um, we do put our money with your money and have a Southern strategy yes, and do. intend to do more in the South. When we look at data, um, women, when we disaggregate data, women do so much worse on almost every measure we look at. And yet when we talk about social justice, we talk about income and we talk about race and we seldom look at these issues um, through a gender lens. And I wonder if you could speak about what you're doing in your policy work and your funding work through a gender lens. Um, Which one was that first? The, um, I'll, let, let me say two points about that. Um, work, first of all, it's a part of our coalition. We have uh, feminist groups, women's groups that are part of our organization, so who've elected to our agenda pushing for pay equity, um, pushing around uh, paid maternity leave was a priority for us in the last legislative session. Uh, so there are some issues. Um, working around gender in the South is tricky. tricky. And one story is uh, my, my old boss is a woman named Brownie Ledbetter. Was, uh, uh, and in 1986, Arkansas was the only, southern, only state in the country to defeat a uh, abortion ballot measure. And, uh, and the way that she did it really ticked off the national women's movement uh, because she was using data and the national women's movement was pushing on Arkansas to run a women's rights campaign against the abortion, abortion ballot measure. And we were looking at data, or we, I was in high school, 
uh, but Brownie was looking at data um, that said uh, that we were going to lose really, really bad if we went down that road. But that showed you can play on the um, social libertarianism streak of the South uh, to basically uh, run an anti, we, she ran an anti-government campaign against the abortion measure. Don't let the government tell your wife, your daughter, and their doctor what to do. And they beat it uh, by two points. So I think sometimes the way that women's work or uh, looks in the South is a little bit different because you just have to deal with the reality of where the, where the populace is and figure out how to frame your issues in ways that are effective. It, that was a short-term win. It doesn't excuse the long-term investment that you need to make it so that you can have the women's rights conversation. It's sort of uh, working tactically in the moment and then also working long-term to change the dynamics over time. So I don't know if that answered. From a funding perspective, I, I just believe we tell the truth and shame the devil. And so um, we work from a, a poverty framework. And so uh, in lots of ways, the data says that um, low-income moms mm -hmm. in, in families, right? Um, and, but it's not disaggregated. It's disaggregated in some of our um, organizations' work that they do, where it's swallowed up, if you will, into a whole policy agenda. We support, um, we have some common um, uh, grantee partners um, for women uh, who were directly affected by Katrina. The, the biggest population that was affected by Katrina was low-income women, right? Um, and so we don't disaggregate it as a foundation, but we support the work on the ground by organizations who, who do work specifically with those populations. Another question, maybe? Thanks for starting with an easy one, appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> the hard ones, thank you. It's good, no, it's great. Oh, okay, hi, thank you all. I'm Beth Hertz from the Cerdna Foundation based in New York. Um, so I'm interested, you talked a little bit about the Southern strategy, and I'm interested in this long, very impressive history we have in this country of dividing cross-class organizing based on very strong anti-black racism and, um, and racism more broadly institutionalized, which, which is to say we would have a very strong movement um, to counter interests and the accumulation of wealth if we were truly looking at shared class-based interests, but racism is often used to break that up. So I'm, I'm interested in what you, how you think that still shows up and where you see some really exciting responses to that here. Um, I resonate a lot with, with what you say. I was just talking uh, with a colleague uh, this morning at breakfast about um, this idea that um, somehow white men and women who find themselves in low wage, dead end, uh, minimum wage jobs that don't have a career track or don't have uh, health benefits, that somehow they've squandered their white privilege uh, and finding themselves uh, in, in that position. And I think that's part of what's missing is, and I think you might have alluded to it, Bill, is that how you find uh, those points of connection that uh, don't do a disjust, uh, an injustice to the history of race in the South, mm -hmm. and the, not just the history, but the, rea the current reality of that. Uh, but that also shows that there is a, a, a bigger, a larger battle to be fought, uh, and that there is a, a world economic order that we sometimes don't, uh, we glimpse it when we talk about income inequality mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, but we miss uh, the outlines of it when we don't understand how our way of life, how this wonderful lunch uh, that we just had is made possible by the sacrifices of individuals who are not present in the room. They're not even present in this country. So I, I, I resonate with you. I think that's the, that's the big challenge for us. I don't think, I think the way that we started to address that challenge is by uh, shying away from uh, playing armchair sociologist. Mm -hmm and uh, just presenting the but facts, so just the facts. <laughs> and the facts uh, speak for themselves and they speak very loudly. Mm -hmm. the, um, can I? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, there's a couple, of, a couple of thoughts. How many folks here have heard of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union? 
their, an acronym sadly is STFU, which means other things. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you can look them up. They're founded actually in Arkansas. In the, in the uh, uh, 19-teens and 20s, there was a lot of really bloody race riots around the, the country, which uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with as well. And that was largely a response to playing the race card uh, by the uh, establishment to break up efforts for economic opportunity for poor whites, uh, tenant farmers, and also poor blacks. And the, in Arkansas, the, uh, the black tenant farmers kept trying to organize, and the, uh, um, the, farmer, the, the, the plantation owners would whip up white fear and go march on them. And then when the uh, white far poor farmers would try to organize, just the opposite would happen, and they just kept playing them off each other. So finally one day, some uh, about 10, I think, farmers, uh, sharecropper farmers, uh, white and black, said, you know, we really ought to form a multiracial union. First one in the country, Tyronza, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, and it led eventually to the end of sharecropping in the United States. Uh, so we've done this before. Uh, we just keep forgetting it. Uh, uh, in, in our organization, when we first started building the Citizens First Congress, our coalition is very multi uh, uh, racial and across the state. We had the worst, hopiest diversity trainings planned, and we never actually implemented them because we kept going, well, man, maybe that's the best idea that we have, but it's still not a very good one. Uh, <laughs> and we, we, it finally dawned on us how to do it when we had um, actually a, a rally, a political rally at the Capitol, and we invited all the folks that we worked with across the state to come and share their stories about uh, what they were just facing in their community. And we planned it for like 45 minutes, two minutes each of a bunch of, of uh, leaders from different organizations. Man, we could not get them off the steps of the Capitol. They stayed up there for four and a half hours, literally sharing their stories. And the lights went off for us, luckily, as a staff. Of, well, this, we just need to get them together, give them a structured dialogue. They're going to share their stories and build the relationships. I mean, you know, I feel stupid for not having think, thought about that because it's really our history in a way is building relationships and sharing stories. And it's the story of the South. Uh, and so that is really still to this day the key that we use to overcome that is building relationships between folks, uh, um, or, but b relationships that are intentional to do something, not just relationships like, well, Reagan's a nice person, I really should get to know her, but, but Reagan and I want to go do something about this common thing, and so we're, we get to know each other through that. Uh, and then just sharing our stories, uh, and that's at least to us been the power. I mean, it's, it's it's harder to do and practice, but that's really the fundamentals of it. And it does, it does work when you do it well. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, we're at time. So please join me in thanking Gladys, Bill, Reagan, and I.